Welcome to a very special interview. I am here with Hall of Famer Igor Larionov. Three Stanley Cups, two Olympic gold medals, triple gold club, the professor, big six hockey management. Shout out there. Uh, Igor, first off, thanks so much for coming here. It's a uh, Hall of Fame weekend. Great to have you here with the Hockey News. Oh, thank you for having me, uh, first of all. Second of all, uh, obviously nice to be uh, back in uh, Canada, in Toronto, uh, for the special weekend. And uh, uh, so far we're having a good time. Uh, yeah, game was yesterday fantastic and uh, looking forward to for the induction ceremony for the, for the inductees and uh, uh, for the great, uh, great night tonight. Excellent. Well, I wanted to start off, you know, going back in history a little bit. You know, you were first known um, for your play with Central Red Army. I know you started off with Kimmich. Um, but just curious, those early days playing back in the Soviet Union, you know, as your career was taking off, what was it like being a hockey star back then in the Soviet Union? Uh, you know what, it's, uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, uh, when you uh, started to play in the game uh, as a kid back home, uh, uh, all your thoughts, you know, you, uh, you go to school, you do your homework, then play a game outdoor, and uh, one day uh, hopefully you can play for the home, uh, uh, hometown team, So, which is like uh, Voskresi has a small town, which has produced like I think five Stanley Cup champions, and, uh, and then uh, and the next uh, you dream to play the, for the national team uh, to uh, 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 winning the gold medals uh, in the Olympics and uh, at the World Championships and uh, and after that, so when you start to grow up and uh, you start to uh, realize and watching the uh, uh, 1972 Summit Series between Canada and Russia, so you're talking about, uh, well, it, I think it's uh, uh, there is a game playing uh, overseas and, uh, and they're they playing really good hockey, so <laughs> they, they, you know, you start to kind of uh, develop that kind of thought and uh, and uh, at age 16, 17, you, uh, you start to read more about uh, NHL and uh, uh, obviously um, uh, to be um, uh, able to join the International Hockey League. But at the same time, answering your question, so uh, when you start to uh, make uh, uh, creating some success as a, as a young player and, uh, and obviously playing with the famous KLM line and the uh, Green Unit back home in the, with the Red Army team, the national team, so uh, you realize how much falling uh, by the fans, by the by the uh, like Russian or Soviet fans and uh, how, how much they appreciate the game and how much they appreciate the success. And for us, it was uh, nice to have that kind of uh, glory days, uh, you know, to be superstars uh, uh, back in the day. Excellent. Now, I understand, obviously, you played in a lot of international tournaments back then, and uh, the team was watched very closely, but you tried to uh, make sure that your, your music collection was always up to date uh, when you went away on trips. Uh, can you tell me about that? Well, I guess uh, the story goes, uh, and I told that story to my favorite uh, musician, uh, Mark Lothar from Dire Straits, and uh, I met Mark in Detroit like, uh, before the show uh, uh, when I came to his concert and uh, through uh, Live Nation people uh, in uh, Midwest uh, back in Detroit. And uh, I think it was 1979, uh, uh, we played a Four Nations tournament. I uh, played for the uh, under-20 uh, junior national team and, uh, uh, in Sweden and uh, kind of s sitting in my hotel room and watching uh, uh, black and white television and, uh, and saw like a little clip of uh, Dire Straits and uh, I really liked the music. So, and uh, I didn't know what the uh, name of the band because at that time was a uh, uh, few bands I knew uh, really well, uh, Beatles obviously and uh, uh, Three Dog Night and uh, you know so <laughs> that type of stuff and uh, uh, and uh, and then uh, when we won the tournament, uh, so we got some little bonus money. I think it was like sixty Swedish crowns, so it, it was enough to buy like next day to go and buy like spend all the money on the LP. So uh, then I bought that LP and and since that time, so I've been uh, a big fan and a big follower of the Dire Straits. And then uh, after that, Mark Walter. So that's the. And uh, obviously the music, uh, it's a part of, uh, uh, part of the life and uh, you know, I can't imagine myself without any, any music every day and uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not only like a, a, a classic rock and it's uh, classical music, jazz and uh, you know, different uh, type of music, so, but uh, still the, the classic stuff is still with me. It's uh, you know, Eric Clapton, Phil Collins, uh, uh, Irish Straits, so uh, U2, you know, and then uh, ACDC. Nice. So yeah, and then... Uh, uh, Genesis, obviously, it's a Phil Collins band. So, like a lot of uh, good music been uh, produced, like uh, 
uh, in the uh, uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So, and uh, I'm still listening to that music to, to this day. Perfect, perfect. Now, uh, you know, on top of the great career uh, in the Soviet Union, obviously, you eventually you came over to the NHL and had a, a fantastic run with a couple of teams. Most noteworthy, of course, the Detroit Red Wings, uh, where you had the most success. Um, curious, you know, as somebody who, is, who had such a long career, what can you say about Scotty Bowman and the job he did behind the bench? Why was he such a good coach in your mind? Well, I, um, uh, the only good things I can say about Scotty, because you know I got uh, I got long career and uh, I played in uh, professional hockey for tw uh, 27 years, and uh, uh, I had uh, two, uh, maybe more, more than more than two, uh, but the longest spells with uh, uh, Viktor Tikhonov uh, in a, with the Red Army team and national team uh, with the Soviet uh, national team, uh, and uh, uh, Scotty Bowman for eight seasons in Detroit, and. Uh, uh, the way the way he saw the game, the way he uh, 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 managed the players, the way he's uh, uh, managed the team, and uh, in certain situation that was spectacular. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, to see him every day behind the bench, see him every practice, you know, see him uh, uh, like creating some success in Detroit. So that was special, you know. Uh, he's got like a, you know, he, uh, you can. Uh, you can see his, uh, you know, his uh, knowledge and his uh, wisdom always, uh, always around the game and always around the team and always, uh, uh, any given day when we played uh, uh, in Detroit and the winning Stanley Cups. So he, he knew what it takes uh, to be the champion. He knew what it takes to, uh, uh, to make the players uh, click and uh, to make the players play better. And, uh, uh, and he was doing that like all, uh, for, for such a long time and they're still doing that in with Chicago as a consultant so and uh, to me uh, uh, you know no doubt in my mind so he was the best uh, coach I ever had uh, in my career. Excellent and you mentioned Viktor Tikhonov I wanted to ask you about him as well um, how different were those two coaches even though obviously Viktor Tikhonov accomplished so much in his career as well? Well you know it's uh, you, uh, you play in uh, two different systems uh, one system uh, uh, you played uh, in um, uh, with the Red Army team, which is uh, uh, it allowed you in those days uh, to to um, uh, kind of uh, not select, but I guess to bring the players, uh, best players, to the one team and uh, and train them for uh, eleven months a year, you know, and then uh, and then play uh, tournaments and play like World Championships, Olympics, and uh, obviously you, you can control uh, every every move, uh, uh, you know, basically take take away the freedom from the players, so and. Uh, uh, and f f f you know, after eight seasons uh, when I played there, so basically you're getting tired of that uh, kind of uh, routine. And, uh, uh, and uh, f to me, that was uh, the only way he knew how to do it. So uh, Scotty was different. So Scotty, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you come to practice, you got your job done. Yeah, you got an hour and a half or hour and 15 minutes on ice. You got, you got to do your stuff like that in the gym. And then you, uh, you got the rest of the day free. So um, basically, uh, you enjoy the game more because uh, you got some rest and you, you can do a, a lot of different things beside the game. So uh, with the Red Army team, basically, it's 24-7 hockey, nothing else. So, and after 10 years, uh, basically, you've been sitting, uh, you've been living in a kind of prison, you know. And, uh, uh, and after 10, 10, 12 seasons, uh, you are getting, uh, you finished uh, playing hockey, you retired, and uh, you got to face the real life and, uh, and that, you know, it's like a coming off, uh, like uh, getting released from the Shushang prison, you know. Yeah. So basically, you got no idea uh, what's going on around uh, around the world, you know, yeah, except hiking. Right. Um, now, I mean, one of the most important uh, eras of hockey was when Russian stars began to come over to the NHL. It, it, it definitely changed the game. And I'm curious, as somebody who saw both leagues uh, you know, and, uh, and saw both styles. When you look at the NHL now, what do you think was the most important contribution of Russians and Russian hockey on the NHL? <coughs> well, I guess uh, <coughs> a different style, different style of thinking, different style of uh, uh, seeing the game, uh, a, a different style of uh, uh, like perception of the game, how you can create chances, how you can uh, like uh, ch change the style, uh, like the game, 
uh, of the game in, in the fly because sometimes you you can go, you can go up and down, you can go chip and chase style of hockey. So which is sometimes it's very exciting for the fans because it's uh, it's a simple one one or two passes in the pack in the, in the zone. So but uh, the Russian style was different. So the Russian uh, Russian style was and uh, that's what we create uh, uh, in Detroit and in North America the third generation. Mm -hmm. So to uh, uh, the pack possession game, so which is the, you, you control the pack, you control the game. So, but you gotta f uh, you, you gotta find uh, you gotta have some uh, right ingredients to understand that game. So, you basically, uh, it, it takes time to uh, uh, the North American players who uh, I've been playing with in Detroit and uh, in Vancouver and San Jose. I like to understand. You know, the game is uh, it's all about. Uh, uh, it's not about just the skating and hitting. So it's uh, it's all about uh, also about thinking. But I think it's most important part uh, part of the game is uh, thinking the game in the right in the in the right way in the right situation and making the right decisions. Mm, excellent. Now on the flip side, I was also curious when you look at Russian hockey and the KHL now, how do you think that league has been influenced by the NHL and North American hockey, if at all? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. It's very hard to say because it's uh, you know uh, f uh, we still I'm talking about uh, we it's uh, in, a, in a KHL in Russia so. Uh, trying to uh, f like uh, figure out which way, which direction we're gonna go because uh, you know this year we, we start to change some uh, uh, size uh, sizes of the rings you know so mm -hmm. like uh, about 24 teams in the KHL and I think about maybe eight or nine or ten I'm not sure exactly number so I uh, uh, um, they kind of decided to uh, make this a uh, small North American size rings which is they like, try to increase the scoring and they try to increase the uh, intensity of the game. So and uh, I guess uh, you know f f then y then you can go to uh, uh, the quality of the players, the quality, of the best players, obviously in the world playing the National Hockey League. So and uh, that's the, you know we got a long a long way to go to go to catch to catch up uh, with the NHL uh, in terms of like uh, uh, the uh, the game itself and the game in the game is which is uh, uh, fun to watch and the and the players fun to play. Excellent. Now, you obviously grew up in the Russian system, uh, but your son, Igor Larionov Jr., um, played a lot of his developmental hockey over here. He played for Honeybaked in Michigan. Uh, he has played in the OHL, in the QMJHL. He's now in the USHL with Muskegon. Uh, I, I'm curious, what have you seen from his development path that, like, how different has it been versus where you were as a teenager, just in terms of what he's going through. You know what? It's uh, 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 the difference is uh, between my development and his development. You know, uh, we grew up in a, in a kind of harsh, uh, harsh like a winter environment, you know, or weather environment. So because you spent a lot of time playing hockey outdoors when uh, when, uh, when you were a kid, and as I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning of our uh, conversation or our interview, so when you. Uh, when you're the kid, so you go to school in the morning, so then you can come back, uh, get some lunch, and uh, you know, uh, and go outside and play hockey. So it's it's basically it's uh, I, I you know I, I remember I remember like uh, when I was maybe like eight or ten years old. So uh, like November seventh, the, the Russian Revolution uh, Day, uh, I mean Soviet Revolution Day, uh, and the parade and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, Moscow and also in a in uh, every town in, in the Soviet Union that time, and after that, like by 12 o'clock in the afternoon, so I was on the pond playing hockey. But it was cold weather, so and uh, and uh, the weather was uh, sticking kind of consistently uh, uh, till like uh, uh, late March. So we played a lot of uh, outdoor hockey. So we just you can develop a lot of good uh, skills uh, skill set, you know, because you know there's no coaches, just like uh, just the puck and uh, and uh, and, the, and the and the boys from the neighborhood, different uh, different ages. So you you play the game and uh, then you go to practice. So uh, my son is uh, obviously as a, a North American kid grew up here. So you know he trained uh, uh, and and, and uh, developed his skills uh, 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 in a few different uh, uh, states of uh, uh, in North America. Like uh, start playing with LA Junior Kings in Los Angeles. So like uh, two three sessions uh, a week, not every day. Like back back home when you play. Uh, uh, outdoor, and then uh, then we moved back to Detroit, and uh, he was getting with scissors and uh, little scissors and uh, and a honey honey bake. But uh, I spent some time, quite a bit, with him to uh, uh, in in a garage or in a, in the gym. Uh, like you know, I have a kind of shooting gallery in my house, and uh, spending some time, I kind of uh, show him uh, kind of a few tricks, and uh, and uh, in the summertime, 
uh, off season, so I kind of uh, uh, trained uh, him and some other boys uh, back in Detroit. So you know what? It's uh, you, you can see the genes and you can see the uh, you can see the uh, mindset and also skill and understanding of the game. It's uh, it's a top level. So so now he's. Uh, uh, just like uh, as, we, as we speak, so he's landing in uh, Russia, in St. Petersburg, you know, so he's been three months, been out with an injury in his hip, so, and he's uh, got medicals tomorrow and uh, start to uh, uh, play the game in, uh, in the Russian league. Mm, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we're going to go to some reader questions now. Um, we got these on, I, I think it's probably Twitter and Facebook, uh, starting with Chris Hevenor. Uh, he asks, as a smaller center, you explained a lot of your success came from being a good decision maker and an intellectual player. Did you study the game off the ice, or did it come naturally? What advice would you give to assist someone in the same position? Well, you know what, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, study the game, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a modern thing. It's a modern, today we got the uh, analysis, analytics, and uh, all that kind of stuff, you know, so all the numbers, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all technology about the computer and, uh, you know, how many passes you make, how many giveaways, how many takeaways, how many this, how many that. So in my game, uh, once again, so when I started to play in, uh, like, uh, organized hockey back home, so uh, obviously not being uh, big and uh, kind of like a developer, so I was playing against older boys, and uh, the only way you can find uh, solution you can you can survive so you gotta you, you gotta use your <laughs> mindset and brain to uh, to play the game so you gotta you gotta find a way you gotta keep your head up you gotta control the puck you gotta do a lot of different little things uh, to uh, to avoid like uh, big collisions and big uh, but at the same time like uh, kind of uh, control the game and dominate the game as a center because you have to uh, be responsible for uh, uh, kind of uh, defense because if you're trying to help the def uh, defense and also you're responsible to uh, keep the your wingers happy you know trying to feed them uh, right and left because you know the yeah you got to do a lot of uh, different things and that's what uh, uh, and my game and and those days kind of made me uh, uh, the player uh, I was you know that just like you know come out and uh, you know play the game and uh, and be aware of what's going on and uh, and uh, be responsible, be accountable for uh, any time, uh, any place you own the ice. So that's the, that's the key. Excellent. Uh, the next one is from the World Table Hockey Association uh, Twitter feed. Is there a practical way that an NHL team today could attain the level of precision and skill that the Detroit Red Wings achieved when they had five-man teams of former Soviet players on the ice at the same time. Do you ever see something like that happening again? You know what, it's, uh, it's, it's that question been asked. And, uh, you know, we played uh, before the, uh, the Russian Five in Detroit, you know, the only one season we played together. So b because of that uh, car accident with Konstantinov. So, but uh, we played eight seasons uh, with the KLM line back, uh, back in the Red Army national team. So, and it's, uh, you know, what it's, uh, I wish we could have the, that type of hike and that type of line. So, but uh, you gotta have some ingredients and uh, uh, to uh, five guys who's uh, unselfish. They're not looking for the uh, for um, like a part of the contract when you got the bonuses. For how many goals I score? You don't care about defense, you know. So you gotta score the goals and get some bonuses. So that time, you know, we just play the game. We play like as a mini team, like five guys. And uh, they, it's no matter who was scoring, who uh, doesn't matter who was, uh, didn't matter who was like uh, making those uh, uh, passes, but we played a uh, uh, really kind of uh, offensive style of hockey, which is every, everybody, five guys in Wolf in offense, five guys, maybe maybe not five guys in, in defense, but <laughs> because we had a trade tech in the net, so he's got to make a couple of saves here and there, yeah. you know, and uh, and we got the chances like uh, outnumber situation, two against one, three against two, four against three, so the basically pack was in the net. So that's the... That's the questions uh, you know I ask myself. How can we get like five guys playing the same style? But uh, if I, if I can go back to the history of the line, like uh, like old five man unit back home, uh, not uh, I'm not talking about the Detroit five man unit. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about like uh, uh, Fetisov, uh, Makarov, so two older guys on on uh, uh, on that line. So they were they were best players in the world junior hockey. They were they, they were making the. Uh, all-star team and the uh, World Junior Championships. And Kasatonov, he was like a second uh, after them. Uh, so he was the man who he was best in his class uh, in the World Juniors. Then Makar, I mean uh, Krutov and myself, so we're the best in the, our category when we saw the five uh, best junior players uh, in the world 
and I'm uh, making year after year, like uh, from the uh, World Juniors making the All-Star team, playing on the same line. And that's, that's what you got. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what you got. You got the, you got the players with the highest, highest like, uh, uh, skill set, you know, plus uh, uh, unselfish, plus uh, uh, team players, and, and plus like, uh, uh, with a huge desire to win. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's what you have. But I'm not sure if you, maybe it's, uh, it's uh, th that's the only way like you can do like when you get the Team Canada or Team Russia. So, uh, but it's only like a, a brief tournament. So yes. for like uh, seven days or 10 days and uh, after that. So you, the players go, you gotta go to their own clubs and then, it, then you got the whatever, you ha whatever you have at the draft and uh, who is available. Fair enough. Uh, a Twitter user named uh, Steam Rice asks, what one hockey skill would you teach a 10 year old to get them to love the game? Well, I guess uh, 10 years old, so that's the, that's the good age uh, to uh, uh, understand the game. Uh, 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 trying to anticipate, uh, trying to uh, uh, like see the game at a different angle, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, meaning uh, you, you, you gotta keep, you gotta keep your head up, you gotta be able to control the puck, you gotta uh, uh, have your head on the swivel, so you gotta look around, you know, see what's going on. You gotta know uh, what's gonna happen next uh, split second. So that's the, that's the key. That's that how you play the game because it's a uh, it's a such a big, such a like uh, such a big boys now playing the game and such uh, such a high speed and uh, you know to me it's uh, it's a very important uh, in this age like at ten. So you uh, you gotta have like balance between the, uh, your uh, stick handling and your uh, and your vision. So you mm. gotta. You gotta look around. You don't, you don't have to look at the puck. So you gotta you gotta know what what next uh, 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 play you're gonna make and uh, what next decision you're gonna make. Mm. So. Excellent. Uh, got two more here for you. Shana Leon asks, "What was the best thing a fan ever did for you?" They're still doing that. So I uh, you know I got the young uh, young uh, kind of a young puppy. I mean a young player. So he's only uh, nine, nine years old. So he's uh, he's a huge fan of the Detroit uh, Russian Five back in Saint Petersburg. So he's uh, he's uh, he's, a, he's a hockey player himself. So he's, uh, he's like uh, he draws some nice early picture for me. So and uh, nice. and uh, next time I'm in Saint Petersburg in about uh, uh, two weeks from now. I think November 30th. I'm I'm there. So he's going to give it to me. So that's the nice to see the. Uh, you know, the in today's world, so they they got like uh, YouTube, they got some like uh, clips, and they got some uh, highlights of our games, and uh, and I'm glad uh, you know the only way uh, you can study, you can improve. So when you yeah, now you you can watch the uh, modern hockey, and you can watch the the uh, the way we played. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's uh, it's a good lesson. So to to me, when I was young, at the same age, I was watching the uh, basically uh, uh, the Soviet national team and the Red Army team, and then. Uh, and the uh, Summit Series 72 and, uh, and that kind of, uh, they start to uh, kind of, uh, 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 it was that time was introduced at Canadian Hockey and then uh, uh, Bobby Clark, Phil Esposito and uh, uh, Yvonne Cornea and uh, uh, you know, Serge Savard, so those, uh, those years, you can watch them and uh, then Bobby Hall with the 1974 with the WHA uh, series. So that's, uh, t now you, you can, uh, uh, you know, you can use uh, internet as, uh, as a tool uh, to get better. Indeed. There you go. And the final question, this is from Mike Derby. He asks, who was your least favorite player to play against in your career? Yeah, well, I guess he knows the answer. I guess he knows, he, he knows the answer. So I guess it was uh, Claude Lemieux. Ah. You know, so you got to be always careful when he's on the ice. So that's the, because, you know, you know, know what to expect. You know, so that's kind of fun. Uh, I'm glad that kind of hockey uh, started to uh, uh, kind of disappear mm -hmm. and, uh, because the, uh, the league, uh, the NHL, uh, trying to make the game cleaner for the for the boys and uh, no like uh, uh, hits from behind and uh, you know so that's the and I'm glad that the league doing that for last like 10, 15 years. Indeed, perfect. Well, thanks so much for doing this, Igor. This has been fantastic, Igor Larionov.